Hello and welcome back. So we're in part two of topic 11 and we're going to chat a bit more about, or I guess get started, with the idea of what section 3.3 uh, describes or details about the width, the minimum width of public corridors for access to exits. And what I want to do is I want to maybe use a, uh, a scene from a movie that you may or may not be familiar with uh, to illustrate this point. Uh, so, uh, picture this. The protagonist is running away from a number of bad people, okay? And as the protagonist is doing so, uh, is making his way through a very busy street. There are so many people that the protagonist actually has to move people out of the way, elbowing them and so on. Okay, so making his way through too many people, right? Not doing so in a very efficient fashion. But suddenly, uh, the protagonist sees an alleyway. There are no people there. So he turns into this alleyway, but no people, but the walls are so close together that the protagonist actually now has gone become stuck. Now with the bad folks chasing after the protagonist, he kind of just finally squeezes through. Okay? So, uh, the reason I brought these items up, this scene up, is because it helps, in my opinion, to illustrate what the building code uh, requires in terms of minimum widths of public corridors for access to exits. Specifically, the building code uh, in section 3.3 requires the following two things be the guidelines for the minimum width of a corridor. First, the bare, bare, bare minimum width of a corridor. Okay, so that's basically the minimum that's required for a single person to make it through a corridor kind of illustrated as the opposite of what's happening to the protagonist in the previous slide by getting stuck, right, because the walls were so close together. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is, well, the first criteria is with no people, but what if there are people? So the second criteria deals with the occupant load, so all the expected people that are expected to be using that floor space. <coughs> Excuse me. So the second criteria is based on the occupant load, the capacity for people in that space, right? And it's illustrated by uh, the fact that the width is required to accommodate it being full of people and people still being able to access uh, it, make their way to the exit. So let's look at this in a bit more detail, okay? The first item, the bare, bare, bare geometric minimum for a single person to make it through a corridor are illustrated in sentences 3.3.1.9, 3, 1 and 2, which basically say, if you have no guidelines, it's 1100 millimeters. But never take my word for it, go read it for yourself to confirm this is true. And the next two items relate to the occupancy of that space. And what I mean by that, the minimum geometric minimums, in terms of width, if it's uh, for an occupancy that's serving patients in a hospital, it goes up to 2,400 millimeters, and that's because you may have to move a patient in their bed with a whole bunch of equipment coming next to it, okay? And the next one is under sentence 3.3.3.3, which basically deals with occupants in um, occupancy B2, B3 for non-ambulatory residents, that is residents that cannot move themselves, and the minimum width in that case is 1,650 millimeters. Okay, and all of these are listed in your course notes, so you want to go check them out and, and also read this in your building code. The second criteria is based on a width that's related to the occupant load. Okay? And if you remember, the occupant load, we covered this in a previous topic, right? When it came to figuring out how many people are going to use a space, and when we figured out how many people are going to use a space for plumbing purposes. Okay, so the first item relates to sentence 1 under article 3.3.1.16, which relates to the fact that the width of a hallway needs to be based also on the number of people going to be using it. And in sentence 2, that if it's for low slope ramps, doorways, and corridors requiring uh, allowing for access to exits, 
you must allow for 6.1 millimeters for every person that you calculate. Okay? This goes up to 9.2 millimeters per person if it's for a steep slope ramp that's allowing, allowing access to an exit and all the way to 18.4 millimeters per person if it's for ramps, doorways and corridors providing access to residents in B2, B3 occupancies. Okay? So go check these out and confirm that this is correct. So what I figured is that we can do some examples. So, welcome to example number one. We're going to do this example and two more just to practice using these two criteria for determining the minimum width of a public corridor that it serves as an access to exit. What we have here is what looks like a floor plan measuring 80 meters wide, uh, sorry, long by 30 meters wide. Looks like an office occupancy from what I can see. I see four office suites. Let's see what example one is asking. What is the minimum required width of the public corridor for this typical floor plan in an office building? So what we're going to do, I recommend this process, but you can use a slightly different process. Ultimately, once you get good at this, you'll be able to do it no problem. So first of all, I'm going to calculate the occupant load for this space. Remember, we've done this already previously. Okay, so go back to the appropriate topic to confirm how to do it if you don't remember it. That's the nice thing of this being all uh, provided for you electronically. Okay? So the number of people that are going to be served by this corridor, we can find that if we start in table 3.1.17.1. Remember that? It contains the occupant load factors in uh, meters squared per person. So we figure out the area of this space, which is 80 meters by 30 meters, and we divide that by the occupant load for this occupancy. Because this is not plumbing purposes, we can use, and it's a deoccupancy, we can use table 3.1.17.1, and we find that the occupant load is 9.3 meters squared per person. So when we take the area divided by 9.3, we get 259 persons. Do the calculation and see if you get the same number. You likely won't. The reason I get 259 and you get a slightly different number, maybe a little less than 259, is because you shouldn't forget. Humans are whole numbers. So if you get a partial number, right, 258 point something, that means 259 humans. Because we are whole numbers. You can't have portions of people. Okay? So 259 people are going to be using this space. So what I'm going to do is I'm then going to figure out the appropriate factor in millimeters per person that will tell us the minimum width based on this number of people. Based on the building code requirements under section 3.3, specifically sentence 2 under article 3.3.1.16, we get 6.1 millimeters per person because it's a deoccupancy and it's a public corridor. Okay, confirm this please in the building code. So 259 times 6.1 gives us 1580 millimeters. Do this calculation. Do you get the same number? What I did is I rounded this to the nearest millimeter up. It can't go down, right? Up. So I get 1580 millimeters. Once you start working, uh, your boss or your company will inform you how they want you to round this number. Okay, maybe it's to the nearest fi 5 millimeters or 10 millimeters or 100 millimeters. Okay, but typically you don't want to leave your number as a decimal. That shows um, inexperience, right? Because it's really not likely that any contractor or builder will be building to a fraction of a millimeter. Okay, it's hard to even measure that little when you're building something like this. Okay? Alright. Once you have this width that's based on the number of people that are going to be using it, you have to check that against the bare, bare minimum, right? That's the geometric minimum that allows one single person to get through for that occupancy. Based on sentence one, under article 3.3.1.9, the bare, bare minimum in this case is 1,100 millimeters. So between the two, between 1,580 and 1,100 millimeters, which one do we pick? 
we pick the largest one, right? So we pick 1,580 millimeters, and then we make that answer obvious and unmistakable. This was okay, right? So let's try something slightly different, okay? Let's move on to example two. Welcome to example number two. So what we have here is another floor space measuring 60 meters long by 20 meters wide. I'm seeing four office suites that are served by a public corridor. And the question is asking what the minimum required width of that corridor is for this floor plan. And it's an office building, as it's shown. We'll employ the same methodology as we did in example number one. Uh, so specifically, we're going to start off by finding how many people are expected on this floor. Because this is not for plumbing purposes, we can just go directly, and it's a de-occupancy, we can just go directly to table 3.1.17.1. So as long as we find the right factor there for a de-occupancy office space, right? we take the area, which is 60 meters by 20 meters, and divide it by 9.3 meters per person. When you do that division, excuse me, you get 130 people. I get that number because I always round up to the nearest person because people are whole numbers. You can't have portions of people. So I'm expecting 130 people. Now that I know how many people are expected to be using that corridor, then I'm going to figure out what the correct factor millimeter per person is for this occupancy and this use. It's a de-occupancy, it's a corridor, so the appropriate requirement is in sentence 3.3.1.16.2. That's sentence 2, so 130 people times 6.1 millimeters per person. When I multiply the two numbers and round it to the nearest millimeter up, I get 793 millimeters. I checked that against the bare minimum, so that's the bare geometric min minimum for a single person, which is 1,100 uh, millimeters. Which one do I pick between the two? Is it 793 the minimum width, or 1,100 millimeters the minimum width? Just like in example number one, you pick the larger one of the two. So in this case, the minimum width of the corridor is 1,100 millimeters and then I make the final answer obvious and unmistakable. Okay, let's do one more example. Okay, let's do example number three and this now looks like a, an apartment building of some sort, right? It's a floor plan for some story in an apartment building. I'm seeing a floor plan measuring 60 meters by 24 meters and I'm seeing I think seven three-bedroom suites. Okay, so let's uh, look at what the question is, ask, is asking. What is the minimum required width of the public corridor for the typical floor of this apartment building? We'll do it exactly using the same methodology as example number one and number three. So um, we're first going to figure out what to use in terms of uh, the appropriate factor for number of people. So if we go to um, clause 3.1.17.1.1b, right, we find that when it comes to bedroom suites, we have to figure out how many bedrooms and then how many people per bedroom, okay? And in this case, we have seven three-bedroom suite, and according to this clause, we have to use two people per, two, two persons per bedroom. So that gives us 42 persons for this. Go to the building code and confirm this. I know we've covered it, but it's good, a good habit and good practice. So now that we know that we need 42 people to be using that public corridor, let's figure out the appropriate coefficient in millimeters per person to give us a minimum width based on 42 people. So we get that the correct factor is 6.1 millimeters per person. Right? And that comes from sentence 2 under article 3.3.1.16. Okay? So when we multiply 42 people by 6.1 millimeters per person, we get 257 millimeters, which is basically like this much. 
You see where I'm going with this? Okay, that's why we always have the minimum requirements based on two factors. Because sometimes, there's just not many people using a corridor, but you still have to make sure that at least one human makes it through. Okay, so we're now going to compare this against the bare, bare minimum, the bare geometric minimum that allows for one person to make it through. Okay, and that according to sentence 1 under article 3.3.1.9 is 1,100 millimeters for a public corridor in a de-occupancy building, okay, for access to exits. So which one do we pick between the two? Just like in example 1 and 2, we picked a larger one of the two. So that is 1,100 millimeters. So then once we determine what the final answer is, we make that obvious and unmistakable. That's it. So this is just three simple examples. Uh, make sure that you can do them and get the same answer without simply looking at these solutions and there's more in the homework for you to practice this, okay? The next item that we'll get started in part three will be dead-end corridors. I think this is a good time for you to maybe take a, another break. Maybe if you have a chance, grab a cup of tea or uh, maybe just get up and exercise and stretch for a bit and I'll see you shortly in uh, part three. Thank you for your time.